So thank you, Graham, for inviting me to be here. You know, I was actually in training for a long time, and uh, for a long time, when people asked my wife what I did, she said, student. And then they would ask her, when does he finish? And she said, never. And then one day I did finish, and I became a researcher and started applying for grants and all that, and they asked her what I did, and she said, beggar. <laughs> and now I'm the guy now who gives out the money, and uh, when people ask her what I do, she says, chief beggar. So <laughs> it's all a matter of perspective. All right. So I bring you greetings from Canada and from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And it's a real pleasure to be here in Dublin. Uh, it's certainly a very beautiful city. I had a chance to walk around yesterday and see all the historic sites. <clears throat> now I'm going to be speaking about uh, the Canadian healthcare system and what we do with research and evidence. I have no conflicts to declare. Uh, this is Ottawa, in case you get a chance to visit. It's a beautiful city. Uh, I'm going to start by giving you a case study of the Canadian Neonatal Network, uh, which is the network that I started. And, uh, and the reason I bring it up is because, uh, first of all, I'm very familiar with it. But secondly, it's also actually a good case study. And in fact, this was uh, the case that was seminal in uh, persuading the government of Canada to invest in what we are now calling the strategy for patient-oriented research. The government and all the ministers and her staff were, you know, skeptical about what research could really do for improving healthcare. And um, so I went to the uh, federal provincial ministers meeting and explained to them what we were trying to do. And after that, um, we launched the, the uh, strategy for patient oriented research and they were persuaded that this was the right thing to do. So this is a billion dollar strategy uh, that we've implemented in Canada and we shall see what the outcomes are. Okay. So I founded the Canadian Neonatal Network back in 1995 uh, after finishing my training in Boston and I went back to Canada. And this is a network of all 30 neonatal intensive care units or NICUs uh, across Canada. And it collects data on a prospective basis from every baby admitted to any NICU in Canada. And this is unique because it doesn't just collect outcomes data, which is what most networks do, but we collect both outcomes and process data. In other words, on a daily basis, we know what we actually do to every baby, every drug, every IV, every procedure, and so on. And the reason we do that is because when you have outcomes, you can compare and see how well or not well they're doing, but you don't know why. And that's why we have the process data, to help us uh, decide how it is. And I'm going to explain to you how this actually works and how we actually use it to improve healthcare. Now, why do we do this? The reason is that, in fact, neonatal intensive care started in the 1960s. Now, you may know the story. Uh, it actually started with John F. Kennedy because his eldest son was born premature and the baby had what we call respiratory distress syndrome. Now, in those days, nobody was uh, giving me mechanical ventilation to babies. The only hospital that was attempting it on an experimental basis was the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And so when the baby was born uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, the question became in the United States, should we transfer this baby to Toronto for treatment? Or do we keep this baby in the United States where there is no treatment? Well, they kept the baby in the Bethesda Naval Hospital, the baby died. And John F. Kennedy said, this will not stand. We have to do something about this. And that was the start of neonatal intensive care. Before that, it didn't exist. Uh, all the babies were treated in the pediatric department. So from that day on, a lot of money was put into the creation of neonatal intensive care units across the world, uh, research, and so on. The result was that from the 60s to the 80s, we actually saw huge improvements in neonatal mortality and morbidity around the world. But from the 1990s onwards, for about 20 years since, there have been no improvements in outcomes. It's been flat. And this is despite all the new technologies and investments we've made uh, in the whole area. And the question became, is it because we have reached the limits of our technology? And do we have to wait for the next jump in technology before we will see improvements in neonatal outcomes again? Now, many of us were looking at this and going like, okay, do we sit around and just wait? Uh, is there anything we can do in the meantime? And here's where people began to realize that, in fact, there are variations in outcomes in different hospitals. So if you look on the left-hand side there, this is mortality among different NICUs in Canada. And you can see that some are very low and some are very high. So obviously, some are doing better than others. And the question is, is there a difference in the practice occurring between these hospitals that we can use to, in fact, improve outcomes. Now, 
the problem with this approach is that uh, the doctors will tell you, well, my patients are different from his or her patients, and you can't compare, and that's why I have worse outcomes. So we had to go around doing what we call a risk adjustment to try and figure out if you've adjusted for all the risks and the patients are being comparable, is there still a difference? And that's on the right-hand side there. You can see that even after a risk adjustment, there are still differences. In other words, there might be opportunities for improving the quality of care by comparing what people do in different hospitals. Now, this is something that's now called comparative effectiveness research. Now, so the question is, can we make use of this information and how do we do that? Now, traditionally, there are two ways by which we approach uh, care change in practices. One is through what we call the RCT approach, where we do studies to compare treatment A versus treatment B, and then to see whether or not there's uh, a better outcome from one treatment compared to the other. We know that this is scientifically very rigorous, but on the other hand, they are best for single interventions. When it comes to multiple interventions or multiple factors and risk factors, it becomes very difficult. It's also time-consuming, it's expensive, it doesn't address organizational or individual behavior. There is no implementation strategy and the results are often not field tested. In industry, on the other hand, they are used to doing what we call CQI or continuous quality improvement. Now, the problem with CQI is that it is considered very subjective by the scientists. And so, you know, it typically involves going down to that famous hospital down the street, see what they do, and copy a whole bunch of stuff, you know, a whole basket of goods, as we call it, and hope that something actually works. It is, however, very suitable for multifactorial interventions and risk factors. It's got a rapid cycle concept. It's inexpensive. It does aim at changing behavior and culture. It's got a strong implementation plan, and sometimes it's field tested and sometimes it's not. So when we put these two side by side, we said, you know, can we make use of the strengths of both of these? In other words, can we introduce some scientific vigor that is similar to what the RCTs do, but at the same time utilize the implementation strength of CQI, combine these together, and maybe we've got something that we can use in healthcare that's different from our traditional approach. And that's how we started. So the first thing we did was to benchmark. In other words, if you're just comparing outcomes, like I said, the doctors will tell you, well, my patients are different from his or her patients. And therefore, you have to have some way of adjusting for the differences in illness severity. And so with uh, colleagues from Boston and actually David Cochran, uh, who is the head of the NICU here at the Rotunda, uh, he was my trainee there at the time, uh, we came up with what is still the gold standard, the SNAP2 score, which is an illness severity adjustment score. And it's highly predictive and remains to this day the most predictive um, uh, illness severity score in existence. Now, having done that, we said, well, can we then come up with a method by which we can utilize the strengths of both CQI and RCTs so that we can have evidence-based quality improvement as opposed to subjective quality improvement? And this is the, the model we came up with. It's called evidence-based practice for improving quality. Now, it's based on three pillars, evidence, context, and facilitation. Now, in evidence, we utilize, obviously, all the published studies, clinical trials, and so on, because we don't want to ignore all that information. But what we do is to make use of local hospital data to try and figure out for each hospital why they're doing well or not well, and how do we actually implement that change so that they can get better outcomes. And I'll explain to you in a minute how that actually works. In context, we want to look at not just what they should do, but in fact, what's the organizational culture, individual behavior, what are the barriers to change at the institution? Because very often, people know what they have to do, but it's actually very hard to implement those changes. It's like telling people to wash hands. You know, we all know we have to wash hands, but getting people to actually do it is actually very difficult. And so, before we even go in to make any changes, we actually send a team into every hospital, we do surveys, we do focus groups, we look at their culture and organization, etc., and we come up with a list of recommendations for them as to what they need to do to change before they even try to attempt a, a, a process for EPIC. And then finally, facilitation. So even when people know what to do, sometimes the leadership has difficulty in making those implementations happen. And so we have a, a firefighting team that actually will fly into a place if they need help to help them implement those changes. So having done all this, we said, okay, well, we have to try it out and see whether it actually works. And nobody will believe us unless we actually do a proper RCT. Because without doing that, they'll say, well, that's just not good enough. 
So we did a cluster randomized control trial to test whether this kind of methodology can actually work. And we chose the two most common morbidities in the NICU, infection and bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease. Now we took 12 hospitals in Canada, divided them into two groups. Half we asked to reduce infection and the other half we asked to reduce lung disease and they were controls for each other. And there was a third group that did nothing because we wanted to see whether or not that would make a difference. Now here's the example of how this actually works. So for infection, for example, we found that 40% of all the infections in the NICU could be in fact attributed to what we call central lines. Because central lines are used commonly in the NICU and they have a high risk for infection. And when we look at different kinds of lines, in fact the percutaneously inserted long lines, which is the ones we insert here in the hand and it goes all the way up to the heart, those were the ones that carried the highest risk compared to other kinds of catheters. So if you address central lines, you can get rid of potentially 40% of all the infections. So that's the kind of thing you want to address, something that has a high attributable risk. You don't want to address the something that accounts for 5% of the infection because you, know, you don't get much bang for the buck when you do that. Now the problem is when you look in the literature for uh, central catheters, it turns out that literature is very mixed. Some people report that using pick lines or percutaneously inserted long lines reduce infection rates, other people say it increase infection rates. So what do you, how do you make use of that information? So here's where we started using the kind of methods that we were uh, developing to try and make use of the data that we have. So in this hospital, using pick lines in the green line reduced infection rates compared to not using pick lines in the black line throughout the duration of use of uh, the, the lines. So they were doing a pretty good job with using these lines because they could reduce infection rates. Now in this hospital, you can see that initially it would reduce infection rates, but after a period of time, infection rates in fact increased beyond uh, the rates that were, they were seeing without using those lines. What this means is that their line insertion protocols are pretty good, but their line maintenance protocols are very bad. So you know now where to begin to target their efforts. Instead of just trying to do everything, they could begin to target the issues that were actually uh, uh, causing them problems. Now this hospital had no clue what they were doing. They had high infection rates when they inserted and high infection rates when they uh, maintained. So they had insertion protocols were a problem, line maintenance was a problem. So they had a lot of things to fix. Now this problem, uh, this hospital was the most interesting one to us because it appeared that they knew what they were doing. Uh, their line infection rates compared to not using line lines were actually low. But their overall line infection rates were very high. And the overall infection rates were very high. So this uh, puzzled us because usually if you have high infection rates, we won't follow what you do. And if you have low infection rates, we will try and copy what you do. But these guys had very high infection rates but low central line rates. So this was an enigma. This is not normally what we do in CQI. So we went to the hospital to talk to them and find out what was happening. It turned out that they realized that they had an infection problem. So two years prior to the start of this study, they actually introduced line protocols that were very effective in reducing infection rates in the central lines. The problem was that they were not addressing the whole range of things that were important for infection. In other words, you have to look at not just lines, but also skin care and so on and so on. And so while they were doing well with their lines, they were getting infections from other sources. So in this case, what we did was we sent all the other hospitals to these guys to learn how to do central lines. We sent these guys to the other hospitals to learn how to do skin care and all those other things. So that's what we mean by trying to be more intelligent and trying to be more targeted in what we try to do and more objective in terms of uh, quality improvement. Rather than just copy a whole bunch of stuff and hope something works, we actually try to look at what are the problems in individual hospitals and what do we have to target to make a difference. So here's the results from that trial that I was talking about, the first uh, uh, trial with two groups. So in the group that was asked to reduce infection rates, they were able to reduce the infections by 34%, which was significant and was good. And there was no change in their lung disease, which was what you would expect. Now in the BPD group or the lung group, they reduced their lung disease by 15%, which was also good and significant. But interestingly enough, the infection rates went down by 44%. Now we aren't exactly sure what, why that happened. Now it could be that this is just a Hawthorne effect from being part of a study. It could also be that you know the babies were not getting lung disease, they did not require ventilation, they could feed, they did not require IVs, and therefore they were not getting infected. Now in the control group there was no change. 
So what this suggests to us is that a method like this can actually work. And in addition, we also found that there was a reduction in length of stay on average of two days per patient uh, in this study cohort. And that resulted in a savings of $7 million per annum on the patients that were in, in this part of the study. So this is the kind of thing that gives you the best of both worlds. You are improving outcomes and re reducing costs. I mean, what more can you ask for? So we said, this is great. We took all the learnings that they had, we created guidelines, and we disseminated them throughout the country to all the hospitals and said, this is what you need to do. And we watched for another two years. What do you think happened? Nada. Right? No change. And we said, OK, just giving people guidelines is not enough. You actually have to engage them in an active process of quality improvement with constant reinforcement, collaboration, and so on, like what we were doing in this study. And so we went on to launch uh, the next trial called EPIC2, where we got funded from CIH for $5 million a year. We took all the hospitals in the country because nobody wanted to be in a control group anymore. Everybody wanted to be intervention group. And so this is a before after study. And we decided to target not one outcome at a time, but to change the uh, paradigm and target multiple outcomes simultaneously. Because if you notice from the results of the first trial, targeting one outcome can affect another outcome. And it could be positive or negative. You don't know. So we decided to target all of them simultaneously. In addition, we decided that we would go around the world and learn from other people. In other words, if we can learn from our own hospitals in Canada, perhaps there are lessons we can learn from other countries. We also wanted to look at the long-term outcomes in the neurodevelopment and also then to develop best practices and establish a national ongoing infrastructure for quality improvement. So here's the results after another two years. We saw a 23% reduction in retinopathy or prematurity, which is a severe eye disease that can cause blindness, 23% reduction in infection rates, 20% reduction in necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a severe intestinal infection that can lead to death. Uh, there was no significant difference in mortality, lung disease, or brain hemorrhage, although there was uh, actually a decrease in the incidence. And there was an overall 8% increase in survival without morbidity. Now, these are national figures, and they are good figures. Um, and, you know, although these are the average, you know, some hospitals clearly did better than others. And when we look at the range, you know, if all the hospitals were able to perform at the highest level, really, we would see another 50% drop easily uh, in, in adverse outcomes. So this showed us that, in fact, this kind of an effort can work. So now we're into EPIC-3, where we are driving for zero. We're never, never going to get a zero, but even another 50% drop would be a major uh, improvement. And we, we have used our learnings now to use more targeted uh, data analysis to help each hospital define their problems and how to deal with them. We're auditing interventions and their impact. And we're also targeting not just clinical practices now, but also processes of care and the systems of care throughout the country. And how can we change the systems for improving quality? And I'll talk about it in a minute. So here's the outcomes after the first 10 years of uh, this kind of effort. Um, this is for babies less than 32 weeks gestation across the country. And you can see a 3% decrease in mortality, a 19% decrease in brain hemorrhage, 68% decrease in severe eye disease, 33% decrease in necrotizing enterocolitis, 45% decrease in infections, 55% decrease in lung disease, and a one-third decrease in any adverse outcomes. In other words, death or any one of these adverse outcomes. In other words, 10 years ago, 45% of all the babies admitted to NICUs either died or had a severe morbidity, and now it's 25%. So that's a huge improvement uh, in outcomes. Now, don't forget I told you that, in fact, for the past 20 years, there have been no improvement in outcomes. And to get these kinds of outcomes improvement is actually a big deal. And this is without using any new technologies or knowledge. This is simply doing better with what we already know. And that's the lesson, all right? Now, the question that my colleagues asked me was, well, how do you know this is, what, this is due to what you actually did? How do you know that, because it's not a randomized controlled trial, how do you know that this is just not because over time things were just getting better? And how do you know this is not just a fluke, the result from one year is a point-to-point -point variation? So we looked at, the data over the 10-year period, and you can see a constant trend. 
is a trend of decreasing uh, adverse outcomes. In other words, we think that actually there has been a continuous improvement uh, in, in the outcomes that we are seeing. Now, to answer the next question, how do you know that this is uh, not just due to time and, and, and better experience and knowledge and all that kind of thing? Well, we compare it with other countries. Now, this is INEO countries, which is uh, developed countries, and this is the UK, Canada, um, Spain, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, um, Japan, uh, Switzerland, Sweden. And uh, these are all the outcomes from these countries over a, a period of four years that we had the data for, and this is population-based data uh, with standardized uh, measurements of outcomes. And you can see that for just about every country is flat. There was actually no improvement in outcomes. That's a similar to a trend we were seeing before, except in Canada. And this is just a four-year window, but you can, I showed you earlier on that, in fact, there was a constant improvement in outcomes. And you can see that Canada came from dead last in 2007 to now one of the best. Now, that little uh, orange line be below there, that's uh, Sweden. Sweden always has some of the best outcomes in the world. And these guys really do a good job. But look how close we are now to Sweden back in 2010. I'd be interested to see what happens now in 2016, right? And the last line, the blue line there is Switzerland. Switzerland has very good outcomes, but you know, they don't really sustain anything less than 25 weeks. So the outcomes are always looking better than others because they don't have a small babies, right? So our goal standard is actually Sweden. And when the Swedes and the Japanese, the Japanese are in the purple line there and the Australians are in the red line, the Australians were always very proud because they always did better than us. But when they saw this, they said, like, holy smokes, how did you do that? And what did you do? So all the other countries are now coming to us to see, like, what exactly did you do? Now, the Swedish have launched their version of Epic. They call it Swepic. The Australians have just launched theirs as well. Uh, and the Japanese have launched theirs and, and so on. So many people are recognizing that this kind of effort can actually make a difference and that you can actually translate what you have from research into actual practice change and make a real difference in outcomes and also in healthcare costs. And so this is the kind of thing that, you know, I think uh, politicians and administrators look at and they go like, okay, I get it. This is how research can actually make a difference. And that's why we need to invest in research. Now I mentioned that we also need to look beyond clinical practice, look at institutional issues and also at systems issues. Now here's mapping all the mortality rate by hospital of birth. And you can see immediately that there are differences. You know, the dark areas are the areas with very high mortality rates and others with lower mortality rates. And you can do this for any outcome you're looking for. And using this kind of uh, a charting and uh, mapping, you can begin to see where the problem areas are and where you need to start addressing those problems. All right? So this is the kind of work that we do in terms of institutional uh, outcomes to look at where the institutions where we need to start targeting our efforts to see how we can improve their practices and how they organize care and so on. You can also look at resource use because resource allocation is very different all across the country. And so we can then look at whether or not there's a misallocation of resources, how we can apply them differently and so on. Just give an example, in British Columbia, which is the province over to the left over there, um, they had the fewest uh, number of NICU or neonatal beds or perinatal beds, for that matter, per thousand births in the country. And what they were doing really was relying on Alberta. And every time they, they, they had too many patients and they over, went over census, they would transfer the patients over to Alberta for management. And that way they could keep their uh, system very efficient. The problem was that in the 1990s, oil price went up. And Alberta is where all our oil is. It's, you know, in case you don't know, Canada has got the second largest oil reserves in the world, second only to Saudi Arabia. And so, you know, the economy in Alberta started booming. And so a lot of people started migrating into Alberta from the rest of the country, and especially young people. And so the birth rate shot up. And suddenly all their beds were filled. And British Columbia had nowhere to send their babies to. So they had to send them to Seattle, down in the United States. Now, as you know, the American system is very expensive. And they were transferring like 9,700 babies a year to Seattle for treatment. And the cost of those 97 babies in Seattle exceeded the cost of the entire budget of the NICU in Vancouver each year, right? So the huge amount of money was spending there and they were going like, this is not sustainable. So they called me and they said, help. So I went there and did some analysis and I showed them, actually, you don't have a problem with NICU beds. You've got enough. What you don't have enough of is community level two beds for retro transfer of patients when they get better. And they were clogging up the NICUs. So the system problem. 
And so I showed them where they could locate those 20 beds that I recommended that they put into the province, and they did that. And the next year, and since then, since 1995 or 97 now, they have not had to transfer any patients to, to Seattle. They saved over $100 million a year. Right. So it's the kind of thing that where, you know, with the information you have, and if you do it right, and you, and you look at how to actually manage a system better, you can actually create a lot of efficiencies by doing so. So as I mentioned earlier on, many countries are now employing EPIC, and we are, we are seeing uh, uh, groups formed now in Latin America, in China, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Sweden, etc. <clears throat> and many people are now, uh, um, you know, doing the same kind of thing. We actually have a conference in February every year in Canada where we bring you know, a multidisciplinary group from all the hospitals together. And they, it, this is not a conference where we invite famous speakers. This is a conference where people roll up their sleeves and they teach each other what works, what did not work, and so on. And they make a plan for the next year, what should they do, etc. And this is really actually very important because it reinforces what they do. And there's also a lot of mutual learning uh, and collaboration that goes on. Now, many countries around the world, as I said, uh, saw what we were doing and realized we have to do the same thing. And so now uh, a new network has grown up. It's called the iNeo network that is run by Dr. Prakesha from my hospital. Uh, and it includes 11 countries now that contribute population-based neonatal data in an effort to benchmark outcomes across countries, but also to mutually learn from each other to see what we can learn from each other that can further improve outcomes. And I look forward to what they will be able to do, because I think that there's going to be lots of opportunities uh, for further improvements. Now let me talk about what we can learn from other countries. This is also a case study in thinking about new models of care. Because I think that improving outcomes, the way I've been talking about comparative and effectiveness research, clinical trials, etc., will take us a long way there, but it's not the full answer. I think that if we're serious about actually making our healthcare system sustainable and the cost sustainable, we have to start thinking outside the box and to think for about new models of way by which we deliver care. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. I'm an economist. And I can tell you that health inflation around the world is running around 6 or 7%. Economic growth is nowhere near that, unless you're in China or India. You know, and if your economic growth is running at 1% a year, increase and your healthcare costs are running at 6 to 7% increase every year, you're cannibalizing everything else, teachers, lawyers, uh, policemen, etc. And that's not sustainable. Right? All right, so what is this family integrated care? Well, this started because when, you know, I look at the NICU and I talk to my parents, the, the parents always tell me, you know, when my baby is admitted to the hospital, I don't even feel like a parent. I have to get a permission from a nurse or a doctor before I can even touch my baby. I don't understand what's going on. I'm overwhelmed, I'm depressed, and so on. And I thought, well, this is not good. Is there a different way by which we can manage um, patients in the hospital? Now, all of us practice what we call family-centered care or patient-centered care. But really, if you look at it carefully, what does it involve? The patient is still looked after by the nurse, the doctor, the therapist, etc., and the family really is a bystander. What we try to do is to make it more convenient for the families to come and visit and, and, and listen to rounds and so on. But they're really not a part of the care process or part of the care team itself. Right. So I started looking around the world to see what I can learn from other countries. And the one that fascinated me the most was Estonia. Now, if I'm the United States and I say, how many of you know Estonia? Maybe one hand will go up. But you guys know where Estonia is, right? I mean, you're in Europe, all right? So it's a little, little country, you know, on the Baltic Sea, used to be part of the Soviet Union until very recently. And when they were part of the Soviet Union, they were very poor and they had no money. And they could not hire nurses. So Adik Levine, who was the director of the NICU there in Estonia, decided he was going to use the parents. So he brought in the parents and he asked the mothers to look after the baby and the nurses to teach them. And he claimed that they didn't do a RCT, but he claimed that, in fact, the parents could do just as good a job. And so he developed a model whereby, since 1980, every time a baby is admitted to the hospital, the mother is also admitted. She stays there 24-7, and she looks after the baby. The nurse's job is not to look after the baby. The nurse's job is to teach the mother how to look after the baby. All right. And the, the parents do everything. The mothers there will do what rounds, they'll give reports, they'll do medical charts, they'll do all the cares for the baby, except for procedures. You don't expect her to do an IV or, or do a lumbar puncture, and that's not going to happen. 
But otherwise, everything else is their job. Right? And, and he claimed that it worked and that he could reduce his nurse utilization by 50%. So I thought, well, this is very interesting. So I went there and I visited, talked to the nurses and the, the, and the parents and all that. And I said, can this really work in Canada? We're a different society. They have a homogeneous society, extended families. When a mother is admitted to the hospital, there's you know extended family look after the other children. We're a nuclear family. We're a different society. We're not homogeneous. We're heterogeneous and so on. So I went back, I talked to my doctors and they said, no, that's a third world country, different medicine. I talked to my nurses, they said, no, you know, we all, in Canada, every nurse has a degree. You expect mothers to do what we do and you're just trying to steal our jobs. <laughs> and then I talked to the parents and they said, best idea since sliced bread. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's see how we can make this work. So I formed three committees, one to look at training, one to look at infrastructure, one to look at operations, and I put the parents in charge. And I gave them teams of doctors and nurses, and I said to the parents, you are in charge. The doctors and nurses will advise you. But you tell us how to make this work, design this. Now, parents are not just parents. They are also doctors, nurses, lawyers, accountants, teachers, and so on. And the teacher will say, I'm an educator. I'll design the education package. I'm a lawyer. I'll do the litigation, and so on. And after six months, they came back to me with a, with a manual, and I read it through. It was that thick. I literally read it through, and I was so impressed. They had thought through everything. So we did a pilot and it showed fantastic results. And then we did a full trial. Now, when we were starting the pilot, the nurses were very angry. Oh my goodness. Angry is an understatement. <laughs> Rebellion was what I was facing. And I said, okay, tell you what, I'm not going to force you to do this. We're going to do a feasibility study. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But help me design this, all right? So I have 62 beds in our NICU. I put four beds aside and I said, Volunteer, and only those nurses who volunteer will be assigned to these babies and help us develop this, change it, and modify it along the way. If you don't want to, you don't have to. And if it's a bad idea, we'll throw it out. Right. So we went on, and 40 of my 180 nurses volunteered. By the time the study was ended in a year, almost every nurse in the NICU said that was right. We had completely changed the culture. All right. Okay. So, in this model, parents are the primary caregivers. They do everything except for IVs and procedures. They do what rounds, they give reports during rounds, they write the medical charts, they do all the monitoring, they do all the cares, they do developmental care. The nurses have to get permission from the parents to touch the baby. The parents do not have to get permission from the nurses to touch the baby. We have reversed everything completely. All right? The nurses, on the other hand, are the teachers and the consultants whereas the parents are the caregivers. Now, that's the huge paradigm shift, all right? So we, did, we then presented the feasibility results to the rest of the country, and everybody said, well, that just makes sense. And then the nurses by this time had been persuaded, and they took up the challenge. And so we ran a multi-center trial in 26 hospitals in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, because the Aussies had said, that's a good idea. We want in on this trial. We said, yeah, OK. And then the Americans said, we want in. We said, no. Because you're too different from us. We don't want to mess up our results. Australians and New Zealanders, okay, they're fair enough. They, they're close enough. Yeah. Anyway, the results, and we, uh, we, we, we have presented the results. We haven't published them yet. They should be published soon. Showed 25% improvement in weight gain for the babies who are looked after by their parents compared to the nurses. There was no difference in mortality or morbidity. The parents showed decreased parental stress and anxiety, increased parental satisfaction, breastfeeding doubled. Right. So all good. Uh, uh, medication errors and, and other errors dropped. So this is now standard of care in my hospital and in most hospitals around Canada. This is now what we do. When a baby is admitted to the hospital, the parents look after the babies, not the nurses. All right? And there's so much international interest now. There's trials happening in the UK, in Europe, in, uh, in the United States, in Japan, in China, and so on. We haven't changed the nursing allocation yet, but clearly we're going to have to look at that. Because you know, if the parents are there spending all their time looking after these babies, is there an opportunity for changing the roles and the allocations of resources and so on? So we know the outcomes are better, and, it's, and if the babies are growing faster, they go home earlier. So again, you reduce length of stay and reduce, you reduce costs. Right? What this is telling us is that we probably got it wrong in modern healthcare. Because we thought that healthcare has to be delivered by professionals to patients who are passive. 
In fact, we need to make them an active part of the healthcare system, an active part of the care process itself. And it's wrong to think that patients are just passive people that we do things to. And if we change that paradigm of thinking, this principle can probably be applied to many other areas of healthcare. Now, what is even more interesting is the neurodevelopmental outcomes, because I was curious if the parents are there looking after the baby, would it actually make a difference in terms of the long-term outcomes? Now, we are still doing our study in Canada. We're doing at 36 months outcomes. But in China, they were fascinated by what we did. And so they did a trial as well. And they did 18 month outcomes. And here's the results. This is the first time I'm showing it. Nobody has seen them yet. They're just going to announce this very soon at one of the conferences. And this is the Bailey scale of infant development, which is a standardized scale that are used around the world. And looking at motor and cognitive. And you can see a seven point improvement in the babies looked after by their parents compared to the babies looked after by nurses. That is huge, all right? So not only are the babies now better in terms of short-term outcomes, their neurodevelopment is actually also better. And I'm not surprised, really. If you think about it, who's the better care giver for the baby than the parents? And when they're there holding the baby all the time, feeding and so on, you're going to get much better outcomes. So. Building on that, we have now launched a whole series of other networks because if you think about a baby, it's not just in the NICU they can improve care. If you really want to improve the outcomes of the baby, you need to be thinking about the whole spectrum of care, everything from antenatal to obstetric care to delivery care to neonatal care and to care beyond the NICU in the community and, and pediatric care and so on. So we've created a whole series of networks looking at antenatal care, surveillance, uh, high-risk obstetric care, neonatal care, surgery, uh, the follow-up and in the community. And this is now an integrated system with a common uh, data system so that they can begin to translate the information that they need and also look at how they can improve the care throughout the whole system. It's the first of this kind anywhere in the world. We are looking at this in a comprehensive manner and we're going to see if we can actually improve outcomes. Now from CIHR, since I'm the guy giving all the money, we've also launched a national strategy to improve uh, outcomes of preterm births because preterm births is now actually the single biggest cause of infant mortality in the world and the largest cause of uh, neurodevelopmental delays, autism, and, and so on. So we've launched a series of grant uh, schemes. Uh, the first is to look at discovery, what are the mechanisms and, and, uh, and causes and biological mechanisms behind preterm birth. The second is look at how do we improve care. I just showed you about networks. The third is how do we improve the healthcare system itself. The fourth is the creation and implementation of a national preterm birth prevention strategy. And finally, how do we integrate all the data? So as far as I know, this is the first national preterm birth uh, strategy uh, that's being launched and we'll see what the outcomes are. Now let me talk about the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and its strategy for patient-oriented research. It was the results that I showed you that were actually instrumental in convincing our ministers. I went to the Federal Provincial Health Ministers meeting and presented them all the data and showed them what we were able to do and they, and they got it. And they said, yes, we will support this. So now we are actually implementing a strategy where we're going to do this across the whole healthcare system. Now, CIHR is similar to the uh, National Health, uh, Health Research Board here in Ireland. We have 13 institutes, and I am the direct director of one of the institutes, uh, the Institute of Human Development, Child and Youth Health. Our annual budget is $1 billion. 70% uh, of the money goes into what we call investigator-initiated research, where the researchers decide the questions. 30% is strategic which uh, is money that we target things, whether it's preterm birth or whatever it tells uh, else. The scientific directors decide where we want to invest the money and then we invest them accordingly. And the money is actually distributed to all the institutes and the institutes are actually the, the, uh, the, the folks who control this money and decide where we want to invest it. And we invest in research across all four pillars from basic science to clinical to health services and population health research. Now, the strategy for patient-oriented uh, research is meant to take the kinds of things I was talking about to so integrate research with clinical care. In fact, if you think about how to improve care, as I mentioned, you, know, you have to do it at the bedside, you have to do it uh, in the institutions, you have to do it in the systems. The last two are actually reasonably well, well dealt with by our administrators because they understand how to do that. The part that's the most difficult for them to grasp and to actually effect changes is the integration and that border between clinical care and management. That's the really hard part for them. 
And so SPORE is meant to try and link that so that people can see how we can actually take that research and actually make it happen in terms of improving care. And so the way we are doing it is that we are creating support units which are methodology based uh, for infrastructure. And then the networks are where we actually implement them across the system, uh, similar to the neonatal network. And then the third piece is uh, capacity development because we still lack the kind of people of the expertise in this area. Fourth is to improve the clinical trials environment. And finally, how do we engage patients in this whole process? So that it's not being driven by administrators or clinicians, but it's actually driven by the patients themselves. So the small support units, we've now invested $430 million uh, into the creation of this infrastructure uh, support units. And each one is based in each of the provinces so that the provinces can direct the questions they need to address to these support units. And the support units can then use the data systems that they have to come up with the answers as to how to make those changes and where to target their, their efforts and so on. And these support units will then provide specialized uh, methodology expertise, uh, the biostatistical analysis that's required to answer the questions, and also create the linked databases and patient treatment registries, information systems, etc., to enable this to happen. In addition, we are creating national networks that will work across the system to implement the kind of changes that I was talking about earlier in neonatal care. And this is directed again by our uh, uh, ministers as well as our healthcare managers and policymakers. And they have chosen to target a number of different areas. The first network was created in youth and adolescent mental health. The second was created in primary and integrated health care. And then five networks have been created in chronic disease uh, prevention and treatment. And these were in brain developmental disabilities, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disorders, kidney diseases, and pain, each one for 25 million apiece, so that we can now begin to target implementation uh, and change on a national basis. What the results will be? Well, I guess we'll see. But as you can see, a lot of money has been invested already, and this is uh, going to continue because more networks will be created. This is a billion dollar strategy that we've implemented across the country. And each of these networks that I'm talking about is not just researchers. They have to be integrated networks of researchers, clinicians, and administrators, and policymakers who will together uh, work on the issues that the policymakers bring to the table and then figure out how they're going to make those changes, how to measure those outcomes, and to make sure that they actually get the results that they require. We're also trying to improve the clinical trials environment. And it's not just about RTTs. This is about pragmatic trials. How do we actually do trials that make a difference in the real world as opposed to doing you know, fancy RCTs that have relevance not to the real world? Right? Now here's an example of how we can make a difference. This is talking about uh, cataract surgery. And in this particular strategy, they're looking at how do you actually streamline the care process for delivering cataract surgery? And they have estimated that in fact the measures that they have put in place in Manitoba alone, for example, will lead to an estimated $1.1 million in savings. And that across the country, this will result in annual savings of between $25 and $30 million. Now, across the uh, support units, for example, in Manitoba, uh, a $41 million investment in the support unit, which is meant to look at not just cataract surgery, but a whole bunch of different things. Even just this one strategy alone will result in an ROI or return investment of about 145 to 190%. So it's a highly effective uh, a way of uh, a re getting a return on investment on the uh, investments we make in healthcare. So in summary, research is relevant to improving the quality of care. In fact, it's critical. And evidence is critical for improving patient outcomes and health systems. And finally, the key is how we integrate research and healthcare provision because unless you bring those two together, you're not going to be able to achieve the outcomes that you want. Thank you very much. This is Toronto. You're welcome to visit us uh, if you get an opportunity.